Well, thanks as always for joining us for our AccuWeather Ready Facebook Live series. We conduct this every one, Wednesday around 1 p.m. And we're talking about different parts of the weather that impact you. Today, we're talking about ticks and more specifically, Lyme disease. We have Dr. Rick Osfeld on the line here. He is a senior scientist at the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. Great to have you here. Great. Thank you very much for having me. So we're talking about ticks and Lyme disease. First up, I want to ask you, uh, what is Lyme disease and how does it spread? Lyme disease is a disease caused by a bacterium. It's a sort of a corkscrew shaped spirochete bacterium that is transmitted to us via the bite of a tick. And in most of North America, the culprit is the black-legged tick. Um, out west, there's a Pacific uh, black-legged tick that can also transmit it. So it's a bacterial infection. It can be treated with antibiotics. And when it's treated early in the infection, it's often curative. You get better um, and you don't um, re retain the symptoms. If it's not treated early, then the bacterium can persist and cause very debilitating chronic symptoms. And there are over 300,000 cases of Lyme disease in the United States every year, new cases each year. Wow, uh, so that's a pretty staggering number. Are there any different regions of the country where you tend to see this breaking out more so than others? Yes, um, there are regions in which Lyme disease is much more of a problem. So that includes the mid-Atlantic and northeastern region from about Virginia up to Maine and stretching out to western Pennsylvania, western New York. And then there's a second very sizable center in the upper Midwest, mostly in Wisconsin and Minnesota. There is Lyme disease on the West Coast. Lyme disease is spreading from that Midwestern and that Northeastern site in pretty much all directions except into the ocean in the case of the Northeast. So it's an expanding area. It is now inundating um, huge population centers in the United States. And the problem is growing um, really by leaps and bounds. So anyone at home who's watching, if you're watching from one of those areas uh, that Dr. Osfeld mentioned, we want you to write in with questions because uh, we want to answer what different people are thinking about specifically. But let's talk about the relationship between perhaps weather and climate change and the tick population. Does that seem to be having any inf influence on how uh, the tick population is expanding? There is evidence that um, certainly that weather affects whether the ticks are active how active they are, what times of year they're active, when they come out. And there is also building evidence that climate change is affecting the pattern uh, in tick-borne disease, especially Lyme, but it's doing so in some rather complex ways that are difficult to study. So we know, for instance, that um, as the climate warms, we've demonstrated from our sites at the Cary Institute that the ticks come out earlier in the season. So in a warming climate, we can expect the ticks to come out earlier in the spring um, and probably in some cases before we're well prepared to protect ourselves. So we need to be alerted to that fact. We've argued that instead of the typical May being Lyme Awareness Month, that we should move that up to April because of the accelerated activity of the important stages in the tick life cycle that uh, can make us sick. We know that as the climate warms, the, the length of the warm season increases. And that looks like it has an effect on the ability of ticks to survive. Um, they spend most of their lives uh, on the ground, in the forest, under the leaf litter, or on the low vegetation, looking for a host. And they can run out of energy and die of starvation if they don't find a host in a specific amount of time. Um, the longer they have to seek a host, the more likely they are to find an animal, including humans, um, and bite us and make us sick. If they have a very short season, then they can drop dead before they ever get to eat, uh, and that will reduce their, their population size. So it looks like the length of the growing season, which increases in a warming climate, is the main mechanism by which Lyme disease risk is spreading into places that previously were too cold, too harsh an environment. 
So you mentioned protecting yourself against ticks. If you're going to be maybe going out for a hike, I think a lot of people hear about perhaps wearing bug repellent uh, or you know doing that uh, fashionable statement where you tuck your pants on into your socks and you wear light colored clothing. Uh, but you're you're leading this tick project study that's going on in specific neighborhoods in the Northeast and around the country. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that and how it maybe targets a different way to approach the tick and the Lyme disease problem? Right, yeah, so several important um, aspects to that question. I mean, you, you sort of have to embrace your inner geek and not worry too much about how ridiculous you look when you tuck your pant legs into your socks. <laughs> you know, if you're gonna be able to protect yourself against Lyme disease, you know, it might be worth it. I, for me it is, but I don't really care. Um, the Tick Project is an effort led by Felicia Keesing at Bard College and me to reduce ticks to a, a strong enough degree and to do so safely in our neighborhoods that we actually reduce the incidence of Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases. So there's a lot of research done on Lyme disease these days. Much of it is on increasing our ability to diagnose it more accurately and when we find people who are sick with Lyme and other tick-borne diseases to treat them more effectively because we have big problems with both diagnosis and treatment. The tick project though is aimed at prevention. Um, we feel as though to the degree that we can reduce ticks and prevent exposures to infected ticks, we will reduce cases of Lyme and make diagnostics and treatment less important than they currently are. We need to do it safely in a way that's safe for the environment, safe for people and pets. Um, and we need to do it very aggressively because we know that a modest decrease in tick abundance is not sufficient to protect us against exposure to tick-borne disease. So what is it exactly that people in your neighborhoods that you've chosen are doing in order to prevent uh, Lyme disease from spreading to ticks that could potentially infect humans? Right, so we have 24 neighborhoods that we've established in um, our focal county, Dutchess County in southeastern New York. It's a place that has had a tremendous amount of Lyme disease for many years. Um, and the people who are participating in our study really don't have to do very much except let us get to work. So what we do is we deploy two tick killing interventions. One of them is a tick killing fungus. So this is a naturally occurring fungus, um, a strain of which is known to be highly specific and highly lethal against ticks. And you spray that with a high pressure sprayer the same way that you would a chemical tick killing substance, um, but it's not a chemical. It's actually a species of fungus that's mixed in solution in water. Um, the other device is a small black box that has holes in the side that allow small mammals like mice and chipmunks to enter. When a mouse or chipmunk enters this box, they brush against a, a little wick that applies a minute drop of a chemical tick killing substance called fipronil, and that's the main ingredient in Frontline that we put on our dogs and cats, and that we know has a very strong safety record. Um, we've been using it on pets for, for decades. So the mice and chipmunks go into the box with ticks on them. They come out of the box with those ticks being on their way to a rapid death. And those ticks on mice and chipmunks are particularly important because they are the, the ticks that feed on mice and chipmunks are largely the ones that get infected and become dangerous to us. Ticks feeding on other hosts like uh, squirrels and deer and raccoons, they tend not to get infected and they never become dangerous. So if we can kill the ticks that we are trying to feed on mice and chipmunks, we're likely to kill the most important, most dangerous ones. So we do one or both of those interventions together with a placebo control and we're following up with all these um, thousands of different households to see how effective it is. I think that's really interesting because growing up I had this notion that there were deer ticks and that it was ticks that bit deer that spread Lyme disease, but pretty much what you just said uh, totally erased that notion and you said it's mostly mice and chipmunks. So now if you have people who live outside of Dutchess County who maybe want to try to replicate what you're doing in their own neighborhoods, could they feasibly make one of these little devices themselves or maybe get their own neighborhoods involved? 
Well, so first about the deer, um, you know, the, the correct common name there, we have rules of naming species in the, the in zoology and in, in biology more generally. And by the rules, the name of the tick, the common name is the black legged tick, but it was called the deer tick when it was thought to be a brand new undescribed species back in the 1980s. Um, it turns out that it was not an undescribed species at all. It had been described 200 years earlier and already named. So the correct name is the black-legged tick, but that doesn't roll off the tongue in the same way that deer tick does. Uh, deer do play a role. They feed many of the adult ticks in the tick life cycle. Um, so I don't mean to imply that deer play no role at all, but they don't infect the ticks and they play a lesser role in boosting tick abundance than do these mice and chipmunks. Um, the Tick Project uh, chose these two interventions on the basis of safety, um, demonstrated efficacy, at least in small scale field trials, and also the availability of the products for use by homeowners um, and municipalities. So we did not want to choose products that might work super well, but wouldn't be available um, right away or even possibly for years. So both the bait boxes and the fungus are available as commercial products. And I would urge any viewers um, to go to tickproject.org to get more information about exactly what they are. I'm not necessarily recommending that folks go out and use them because the whole point of the Tick Project is to test how effective they are at protecting the public health. We'll have our results uh, available shortly. You know, it does take a little while, a year or two perhaps, but um, it might make sense to wait until we see how effective they are before going out and spending the money to do it yourself. This might be something that we could think about doing maybe uh, not necessarily this spring, but perhaps next spring or the one after that, maybe uh, using some of the results that you found. Are there any initial thoughts that you have about what your results might be? It seems like a lot of it is focusing on killing the actual tick. So does that um, perhaps raise any other questions in regards to the ecology of the Northeast or in general? Well, I, I guess one answer I would give is that one thing I, I haven't emphasized yet, but it's important, is that we are conducting these interventions at the level of entire neighborhoods, or at least most of the households in a neighborhood. There are previous studies in which ticks on individual properties are reduced by various means, including chemical sprays, um, and that tick reduction is expected to reduce our exposure and encounter rates with ticks and tick-borne disease, but it has not been demonstrated to do so. So not only are we trying to be more aggressive at reducing ticks, but we're trying to do it in multiple properties within a neighborhood because you can get exposed outside your own backyard, elsewhere in the neighborhood as you walk your dog or jog or recreate in some way or even picnic. Um, so I think that, um, in terms of the impact that reducing ticks might have on the broader ecosystem, we are monitoring that very carefully. We are monitoring the abundance of various kinds of animals, mammals, and birds on these properties. Um, the ticks do get, uh, there are a few species that consume ticks, like this fungus that kills ticks and consumes them, digests them, um, but the fungus makes its, can make its living on other creatures as unexpected disruption to these ecosystems, we don't expect that to be a, a big effect, but we'll monitor it very carefully to be sure. So just to, to remind our viewers at home, they can go to the tickproject.org to perhaps follow up on the results of your study once they're out and released? They can. Um, they can also go on that site right now and get a lot more details about the study design the nature of the placebos, what are the, the, the measurements that we're taking, and how long the study will be going on, and the like. Well, I find what you're doing really interesting. I think it's going to have some neat implications, especially for folks who are in uh, those Lyme disease areas. Um, we're going to wrap this up for now, but we're also going to allow our viewers to continue to ask questions in the comments thread. So feel free uh, to check back on in and uh, to maybe see what some folks are asking about. Dr. Osfeld, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope to get to speak with you and collaborate with you in the future. And everyone at home, thank you so much for watching and be sure to tune in next week at 1 p.m.